Senior Senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, uh, creator of the Consumer Financial Regulation Bureau, distinguished law professor for 30 years, and our lunch guest is here, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's good to be here. So we'll have a little time for questions at the end. Um, you know, we're here at an interesting time in many ways in Washington, but on the question of financial regulation in particular, it does seem that maybe we're at an inflection point that, you know, the, the Trump administration clearly has come into office um, and the congressional uh, uh, Republicans believe that the, the pendulum perhaps has swung too far, that um, both for political and economic reasons, uh, the regulatory pendulum needed to be pulled back into place and that's what the Treasury Department and that's what House Republicans have shown us in the last week. Are they right or are they wrong? Well, Donald, wait just a minute. Let's be clear. You say they came into office on that. That's certainly not what Donald Trump ran on. Donald Trump ran on Glass-Steagall, on breaking up the biggest financial institutions in this country. He said it, you know, at least eight bazillion times that he wanted to break up Glass-Steagall. He got it put into the Republican platform. It was also in the Democratic platform. And let's just talk about most of America here. You do the polls across this country, and I'm talking about polls of everybody, Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians, vegetarians, everybody. <laughs> you do those polls across the country, and somewhere in the neighborhood, about 80% and up, upwards, believe that the largest financial institutions in this country need more regulation, not less regulation. They're not looking for trimming back regulation. I'll give you one more on it mm -hmm. just because it's so much fun. <laughs> the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, you know, the little agency that's been in place for about five years that has been the, uh, the bullseye uh, for all of the Republican attacks in the House and many in the Senate. That little agency among Trump voters about 55% think the agency should either be left as is or be given greater powers than it currently has. So let's, when we're talking about pendulums, let's be real clear that we are not talking about the views of the American people or the voters in the 2016 election. Nonetheless, yesterday the Treasury Department put out a report on financial regulation, recommended perhaps 100 different moves, mostly to deregulate. Yep. Uh, the House passed the Choice Act about a week ago, did yep. the same thing, many of the same things. The, the Treasury talks about fewer stress tests for banks, more cost-benefit analysis of new regulations, higher threshold for big bank rules to kick in, um, exemptions from, of, uh, for small banks from the Volcker Rule. Um, that is the Trump administration's policy as of yesterday. As of yesterday, it seems to be. So let me get this straight. The sum of the biggest financial institutions in this country are now bigger than they were when they were too big to fail. And the Republican plan, now evidently joined in part with the, the Republican administration, is to say, I know, let's do less regulations, submit them to fewer stress tests, have fewer of them subject to the Volcker rule. Let's trim back on a lot of that, because what could possibly go wrong? Nobody remembers what happened in 2008. Uh, in fact, as I understand the House, which we've had more time to look at the specific language, in many cases what the House wants to do with some of the biggest financial institutions is they want to cut regulations back to be not just where they were when everything crashed in 2008, but even weaker regulations than we had in 2008. And you know, I just got to say to a crowd like this, boy, Everybody should be saying, no, 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 no. Yes, there may be some financial institutions that would have better short-term, you know, quarter-by-quarter quarter profits on this. But everyone in this room needs to remember that the most conservative estimate of the costs of that crash in 2008 was not just the $700 billion bailout. It was the $14 trillion that it cost the entire economy in homes lost, in jobs lost, in savings lost. People in this room should understand that better than anyone. Whether you're in retail, whether you're hoping for loans in the future, wherever you are on that spectrum. And this ought to be one of the things that should unite all of us in saying, no, we are not in favor of deregulation that puts the American taxpayer and more importantly, the American economy 
at greater risk. So, you know, one of the reasons, to go back to my pendulum analogy at the beginning, that Republicans s make that case is they say community banks in particular have been, have been devastated by Dodd-Frank. Um, the number of com commercial banks in the United States at the end of 2016 was 5,100. In 1996, that was 9,700. Only eight groups filed to create new banks uh, last year. In 2005, 299 groups did that. That's evidence, they say, that the community bank sector has been hurt in disproportionately and that hurts average but, Americans more. But your more. numbers precede Dodd-Frank dramatically. In fact, if anyone looks at the numbers in bank consolidation in America, the consolidation starts back in the 1970s, uh, long before we went through any of these cycles around uh, changing the regulations. And let's keep in mind, the community banks, along with the big banks, banks, all of them across the board pretty much, are more profitable than ever. And lending in most of these institutions is not down, it is up. In other words, it's looking good. So don't get me wrong on this. There are places where we should do targeted changes in the laws and regulations to make sure that community banks don't have to endure regulations uh, for problems like uh, disrupting the entire U.S. economy when they really don't pose that kind of threat. But I want to be clear, for a long time now, folks on my side, including me, have offered to say, tell you what, let's sit down and write some legislation that is aimed specifically at the community banks and the credit unions, making sure that they get some regulatory relief. But excuse me, when you start describing yourself in terms of tens of billions of dollars, you stay on the other side and it's an entirely different conversation. So, so that raises an interesting question here to flip this conversation on its head a bit. Are there areas where you can work with the Trump administration in this area? For example, the Treasury does not seem to have come out in favor of complete uh, uh, revocation of the Volcker Rule. Um, it ha does want the CFPB to be run by a single director, not by a commission. Right. It breaks with other Republicans in doing that. Right. Is there a common ground here anywhere? So, look, any place, uh, what you're really saying is there are places where they're not changing the law. I mean, those are the two examples you gave. Yeah. And my answer is, yeah, we can work together when you're not changing the law. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> And I think that's important. But you also just said there are probably areas where things could be tweaked. Absolutely. There are areas, and, and, and look, I don't, want to, I don't want to minimize this point. For a community bank, for a credit union that's out there trying to serve its members, trying to serve its customers, boy, those differences in how the regulations grab can be life or death for some of them. So there are things we not only could do, there are things we should do. But all of that has been held hostage to, uh-uh. What you gotta do is you gotta loosen up the regulation on the biggest boys in the game. And for that, my answer's no. Um, so it's not the, financial regulation isn't obviously the only big issue on the table. Tax reform is on the table. We've had several discussions uh, already today, including Ch Chairman Brady from the House side, um, laid out his vision of what could or couldn't happen. Um, from the Democrats' point of view in the Senate, what is possible, what's not possible, what's the path forward on tax reform, if you see one at all? So it looks like to me that uh, we're moving forward on a tax bill over the next two or three weeks. It's called health care reform, but basically it says let's cut taxes for millionaires and billionaires, for maybe some folks in this room and people you work for. Let's cut those taxes, and the way we're going to pay for it is we're going to knock millions of people off health care coverage, raise costs for people over 50, uh, open the door for insurance companies uh, to be able to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions or to have caps on insurance coverage so at the moment you need help most, that help will disappear. Um, there it is. That is the biggest form of tax relief for millionaires and billionaires that's right on the table. And you know, this is one, when you asked me to come here today, I said, you bet. This is. She did say that actually. I actually it's true. did. It's true. I actually did because this is one that I don't understand many of the people in this room and I don't understand the companies that you represent. You know, you, the, I'm here with a whole bunch of folks who represent, what did, what did you all say in advertising this, the most influential Right? 
Come on, that's, that's what the it most, says. I don't know, we have you know, numbers. People who, right, make, make the world go round, or whatever the, the phrase was. <laughs> And people who have not been shy, companies that have not been shy, about stepping out where they want to see changes in the law. Companies that have spoken up about how we can't have a border uh, 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 adjustment tax. Companies that have said, yeah, it's really important to change uh, the corporate tax rate. Companies that have stepped up, oh, important to roll back regulations. Where are you all on health care? I mean, Let's face it, you could do this with dollars and cents. What's the cost that's climbing the fastest for probably every corporation represented in this room? It's health care. And the Republicans are sitting over there in secret, 13 of them, trying to figure out how to roll back health care coverage and, as part of that, roll back many of the reforms that were starting to drive down health care costs. That should matter a lot to people in this room for your employees. And by the way, for any of you who have customers, it should matter a lot if your customers are going to lose health care coverage, if your customers are going to have the kind of minimalist coverage that says, yeah, you get this much covered with an out-of-pocket, and then once you get really sick, once you have a baby with a serious problem, you're just out of the consumer economy. There's no help left for you. And we're talking about not a handful of people. We're talking about tens of millions of people who will be affected. One sixth of the entire US economy. And most of the companies represented in this room have not had a word to say about that. Not had a word to say about a process in which 13 men are behind a locked door and their horse trading over their political futures and how they're going to have to make health care come out. And they don't even want to put that bill out there where other Democrats and Republicans get to read it, where, where you get to read it, where experts get to read it, where families at home get to read it. You know, this is, this is huge for American democracy that somehow it has become okay on something as personal as health care, on something that is as big in the American economy as health care, and that you're all sitting silently by, well, 13 Republicans, man, they're going to do it. And the word is, they're going to drop the old bill, let us debate it, meaning the House bill, jerk it up, put in the new bill after debate time is run and everybody votes and leaves town. That's not how law is supposed to be made in a democracy. And it's not how law should be made if you care about the survival of your employees, your customers, and this economy. Yeah, but if that's what happens, is there a chance that a, a law this big could actually pass that way? Yeah, are you kidding? Well, I'm, I'm asking because there are some Republicans who are not happy with the process you just described either right now. Yeah. And they got to have every single one well, of them on board, Well, all I'm saying right? is Mitch McConnell sure is smiling while he's walking through the halls. I'm not smiling at you, I'm guessing. Well, that's true. <laughs> true. Okay, you, you right. nailed that one. All right, so, okay. okay, but let's go back to the, to the core issue here. Even if the cost curve has flattened out, the premium curve has gone up. Yeah. Way up. Yeah. So there is a problem here. Oh, there's a huge problem. And what are you here. leaving aside what those 13 guys are doing? What do you do about that problem? Okay, so we've actually got some bills on the table right now to start to deal with this. The big one is in the prescription drug area, mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of things we could do. Al Franken and I have a bill that's really just kind of a menu. It says there are a lot of different ways that we can attack prescription drug costs, and we're willing to debate any of them. We're willing to put them together. It doesn't have to be a one size fits all. Uh, Bernie Sanders and other Democrats and I have got a bill uh, that says, let's import from Canada, where it is often the case, think about this, that Canadians are buying the same drug from the same manufacturer under all the same constraints for one-tenth the price that Americans are paying. And if we just, you just bend some of that down, it has two immediate effects. One is it reduces the amount of out-of-pocket that a lot of people would have to pay. And the second is 
it would reduce the pressure on the insurance companies for having about, to cover these huge you're, you're talking about FDA increases. reform is really what you're talking about here. Well, you can call it FDA reform. I mean, it's health care reform. Mm -hmm. It says, hey, we could go in, we could, we could negotiate, we could let Medicare, right? We could mm -hmm. negotiate drug prices. There are a lot, of, and I'm just picking this one area. Mm -hmm. This is an area where we could help bring down costs and we could do it almost immediately. We don't have to build something new to say that, look, the Canadian system, they examine their drugs very much like the FDA does. In fact, they often use FDA approval. That's, it's just a pricing difference that we've got right now. We could open that up and immediately drop the cost of health care for millions of people across this country. There's a start. So you've spoken directly to people in this yeah, room. I want, I I want them to have okay. a chance to speak directly uh -huh. back to you. Okay. So um, it, it, we have microphones, and if we have hands, we'll do it. If not, we'll just continue this. But uh, I could cold call them. <laughs> I got good at that law school. That's true. You know, I'm she, really good. She was I just a law want you to know. She was a law professor. That's right. You, you Back pick. row is where <laughs> right. I start, right? Uh -huh. So, hands, anyone? Uh -huh. save, your, save your neighbors. Really? Right, uh -huh. sorry. Here we go. Oh, there, right there. Sorry. Hi, um, I'm from Watertown, Massachusetts. Oh, right yay, Watertown. Um, I'm also right. not here as a, a, plant, a CFO. Uh -huh. yeah. If you couldn't guess, I'm not here as a CFO. Um, I'm uh -huh. an economist at Center for American Progress, uh -huh. and I do work, uh, a lot of research on small business. Uh -huh. um, so one of the things I'm thinking of a lot in this regulation space, that how much regulation affects small ver business versus big business, and how you create a regulatory system that allows more competition so small businesses can sort of start to thrive and compete with big businesses. Got so this is a fabulous question. And let me just go back. I want to make two pitches around this. I, I went straight to healthcare when you asked me mm -hmm. about taxes, because this is a tax mm -hmm. bill, the, the so-called health care bill. But I want to talk about tax reform generally for just a mm -hmm. minute. I think the key to what we should be doing in tax reform is looking at the differential between what giant businesses most of the folks representing here in the room, and small and medium-sized businesses can do with taxes. One of the things that, that troubles me a lot is that the biggest businesses can invest in creating tax loopholes through the legislative process and then invest in the finest lawyers to exploit every one of those loopholes, moving money overseas, uh, uh, deciding that uh, profits were all made in Europe and costs were all absorbed here in the United States in order to defer paying taxes. Small businesses don't get to do that. Small businesses, medium-sized businesses, they don't get to do that. They don't have money hidden in the tax haven countries. They don't have money that they can say, I know, I'll do operations over there and over here. When you're here in the United States, the tax system looks very different. And if we were talking about tax reform, for me it would be a lot less about what people in this room have lobbied for, and that is to bring down the marginal rate that almost no giant corporation is paying, and so has become the straw man in this debate, to bring that down. Instead of having that debate, how about having the debate about stitching up the loopholes so that little businesses and big businesses kind of have to approach taxes and pay taxes the same way. I think that would be far more valuable. Now, having said that, I know I took your question in another direction. I will add one more part to it about regulation. This is one of the things that worries me most, and it worried me the most when I was setting up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And that is, it goes to a point like taxes. Complexity in regulation works great for those who can hire armies of lawyers. It works great for those who can hire armies of lobbyists to get little words changed. So that again, there are places to exploit through every part of the regulatory process. And it crushes opportunities for small businesses, for those who want to be able to get into the game. So I'm one of those people who believes the principles we should be following is we need simplicity, and every time we talk about regulations, we should be running it through the lens of not just how does it feel for a multi-bazillion dollar business, but how does it feel for a you know, hundred million dollar business? How, how much effort, how much cost is it going to cost? And the third one, how's it going to feel to a startup? 
How's it going to feel to someone who's watching every nickel trying to get into this business? Because ultimately, the role of government here should be in part to support Markets that work, and that means markets with competition. And I think regulation has become one of the ways to stifle competition. So just to be clear on your tax point, if you stitch up those loopholes, does that allow you to notch the, the top corporate rate down a couple of pegs? Well, you know, I, I got a question first about you got to make the case why. I mean, look at where we are right now. So uh, the loophole point would be, what is it? Uh, uh, Verizon, uh, General Electric, and Boeing over a five-year period made uh, $80 billion in profits. Anybody want to guess how much they paid in taxes? Anybody want to guess? Zero. OK, actually, it wasn't zero. They got rebates. Uh, so they actually made money uh, from the US taxpayer at the same time. So there's a lot, a lot of work to be done there. But the rest of it is to ask the fundamental question. What is the fair share for giant corporations to pay? I think, we, I think we need to have that conversation. Because when you look at how much US corporations pay, the big guys, how much the big corporations are paying all in as a proportion of GDP, we are among the lowest of the OECD countries. And so the, the fundamental question, before we go to rates, before we go to anything else, is what should be the tax responsibility of the biggest companies in this country? Because I would sure argue right now, you're not paying it. We have time for one more question. I think we have to let uh, the senator get out of here, and we can go right there. Hi, I'm Arun Sundarajan from New York University. Um, so last year, you made some remarks about the gig economy uh -huh. um, that were taken in the context of you being opposed to it. I mean, if you peel back the layers, you it seemed like you spoke out in favor of protecting workers independent of their employment status. Um, but I, I just, you know, I understand that there's, um, there's a lot on the Senate's mind, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, at this point in time. But an uh, extremely large fraction of the workforce is not going to be full-time employees in the coming decades in the United States. So I'm wondering what, what if any progress is being made um, towards sort of extending the social safety net to people who don't have traditional full-time jobs? So I'm really surprised that you would describe, I know the speech you're referring to, as that I was somehow opposed to the gig I economy. <laughs> I don't write headlines. Um, uh, because the whole point of that particular speech, and then I will make the point here to everyone, is yeah, the gig economy is here, it's coming. And what the gig economy means is that the old combination of implicit and explicit employee-employer relationship is built on a model that just covers an ever-shrinking fraction of our economy. And that the problem is we've maintained the model. And we keep the rules in the model. And that's a problem going forward. So I'll make two pitches on this. So for example, there are places we need to get the laws out of the way. Do you realize that if Uber is right, and I always want to do that caveat, but if Uber is right, that every Uber driver is an independent contractor, then that means no two Uber drivers in America are permitted to talk to each other about the money they earn. They can't get together and negotiate for better terms, for better conditions. Why? Because technically, if they're all 1099s, they are all independent businesses. It would be a violation of antitrust laws. Well, you know, we ought to change that. That's just nuts in a gig economy. And same for other places where it's platforms and people working. So there are some places where government should just damn well get out of the way. Then there are some places where I think government has to take an affirmative step. And the one I would argue here is the days when your benefits are tied directly to your employer and your employer, like a, like a, a generous parent, holds them for you until you need them. Those days are just gone. And it is now time for full portability so that every hour someone works, whether it's for the same employer or for three employers or for 30 employers, they're getting some credit 
out of the money that comes, some is being withheld. And they're getting some credit toward uh, uh, vacations and sick pay and, uh, 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 and retirement, the things that, that we need to build out. So I think that's the second part. And the third part, and I think you're right, I think that now we do need to be thinking again about the social safety net. And can I just throw one way in to think about the social safety net that's not the way many people think about it? You know, when I talk to, not to you guys, but I talk to, I don't talk to guys like you very much, so that's why I'm, <laughs> that's why I'm using this opportunity. Uh, nobody gets out of here without having heard it. Uh, but when I talk to folks who, who work and who are worried about their futures, who are out of work, I make the point, you gotta repaint your house about every five years, right? In the 21st century, you gotta repaint your brain about every five years. And that means this notion that we still have that dates back centuries, that you stopped your education at, fill in the blank, eighth grade, twelfth grade, two years of technical training, four years of college, even a graduate degree. Not in this world. In this world, you gotta go back and refresh. You gotta go back and learn the new thing. You gotta be ready to pick up a new skill so that you're competitive in a 21st century market. And a big part for me of what the overall package should look like is lifetime learning that we all help pay for. Because A, we're all gonna need it, or at least a whole lot of us, and B, it's gonna benefit all of us. You wanna see productivity jump back up in the United States, how about we got more and more workers who are more and more productive because they're ready for that 21st century economy. So I get it, gig economy is here. That means we gotta make some adjustments in Washington. Senator Warren, thank you. You, thank you. you have persisted here, one I might, have might even say. Yes, you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.